Originally, I thought, yes, okay, I'm going to call it Harlow because the New York Post did this this thing, and that you know, it's in the book. And and then I I talked to a roommate of mine after I was finished with the book, and you know, I mentioned that I wrote her into the book. There's a funny scene of the two of them, and we were reminiscing about how she was always, you know, just so authentic and so unapologetically herself. And and then she stopped me and she said, Caroline, that's what you have to call it. You have to call it unapologetic. Hello, you are listening to the Late Bloomer Living Podcast, where we are reimagining and redefining what it means to be in midlife, where we are gathering energy, momentum, and excitement for our next chapter via candid conversations with other midlifers about their own pivots, pitfalls, and triumphs. I'm Yvonne Marchese, your host, and I'm so happy you're here. Do you think of your parents as full-blown people? Is that a strange question? Okay, bear with me. Here, here's, my, here's my theory, that when we're young, we see our parents pretty exclusively through the lens of being our parent. My mom is mom. My dad is dad. They exist only in relationship to me. I think that's just a function of of youth, perhaps. I think, though, that as we get older, we start to see them as people, as people who had lives before we existed as their children. And I'm excited for you to meet today's guest because what she has done is write a memoir about her mother that was part of her grieving process, Um, going through her mother's belongings. She started to process this for herself and started to write it down, which then turned into a memoir, which she has now published in her 40s. And, you know, she, she has written articles before, but this is her first book. My guest today is Caroline Nadine Helsing, and the name of her book is Unapologetic, tales of the original party crasher. And what she does in this book is she examines and celebrates her mom's story through the clues and memories that were left behind. And her mom was just this fascinating woman, uh, as she says, equal parts, Holly Golightly, Auntie Mame, Mrs. Maisel, you know, and it goes back to a time when her mom was, was a young woman and was formed as a person. I think that would be an interesting exercise for any of us to go through, is to try to write the life story of our parents as real, fully formed people and not just mom or dad. Anyway, I think you get where I'm going with this. All right. So without further ado, here's Caroline Nadine Helsing. Let's go. Hey, Caroline, thank you so much for being with me. Oh, it's so fun. I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) I'm so happy you're here. And I want to give a shout out to Crystal Fox for introducing us. I always like to say how I met people. And I know Crystal through this podcasting community that's kind of come together in Clubhouse. And and then she sent you my way. And thank Uh, you, Crystal. (laughs) Crystal. (laughs) Yeah, she's great. So, man, I'm... You have a book you've written. I do. That's amazing. <laughs> and I would say it's a brave book mm-hmm. yeah. because it's so near and dear to you and to your life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go back and give us a little bit of your history and what led you into writing your book. Sure. So originally I'm from Hawaii, Honolulu, Hawaii. And <laughs> yeah, it was a wonderful place to grow up. Do you get that uh, a lot, by the way? I, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, still, it's still home to me, you know? I mean, there's nothing like it from, you know, any place you've grown up. But I, I love where I'm living now. I'm living in Newport Beach at the moment. Mm-hmm. But it was my whole life. I love, I just, I love the concept of your show about, you know, everyone's pivots. And I, I, I love pivots. I love change. So if I look back on my life, I had, I feel like I've had so many different lifetimes because I've done so many different things. You have, um, you have, we have that in common. I call myself a serial pivoter and you I have certainly that. been it's that. Exciting, right? And I, I, I know we were both, we, you were a photographer. And so I had that background and I, I just found out that you have a stage background too. Is I that do. right? Yeah. yeah. So we both, 
So that's what brought me to California because I was doing acting in, in Honolulu and commercial work. And, you know, of course you have to see what's out there on the mainland, right? When you're in that industry. So I was doing that for about eight and a half years in, in LA. And I brought my little Lhasa up. So my little dog, Bentley, with me. And yeah, he was my little buddy. And he used to jump up onto my bed and sleep with me, you know, as little dogs do. Yeah, <laughs> I grew up with Shih Tzus, very, very similar to the Lasso Ops. Yeah, very the look, right? Yeah. I it's, love that. Yeah, when people say, what's what's a Lasso? I always compare it to a Shih Tzu, but they, they have more of an underbite. And then my dog had this little snaggle tooth on the side and like a little <laughs> bust. It was the cute, oh, and he, I called him the grumpy old man. He was, he was the best. <laughs> He's all, get um, off my lawn. Oh, yeah, he, he hated everyone, but... He, yeah, he was great. And so I had gotten in a new bed, a new mattress that was higher than my old one. And so Bentley couldn't get up onto the bed anymore. Poor little guy kept trying to jump up and falling down. So I essentially, I made a dog step for him to get up onto my bed. Cause at the time, you know, I looked everywhere for a ramp or something to assist him and nothing, there was nothing on the market at the time. And I feel like now there's, there's so many options, but when I I was looking, there was nothing. So I made uh, a dog step and then, you know, friends sort of found out and, you know, they're like, oh, I, I'd like one. I'd like one. And I've always been entrepreneurial my whole life. So of course, I, you know, I started making them and then that evolved into literally a manufacturing company of pet products. I wound up creating t-shirts with slogans that had sayings like bitches love me it was a fun tongue-in-cheek so we had all of the, those original sayings had about 250 different sayings that we would you would put on a dog kind of like what's their personality or what would they say if they could talk so I had a lot of fun with that and I hit at a really it sounds good like a lot of fun it was, yeah it was, and I love being creative and it, and it was I love animals I feel like I gravitate toward them more than people half the time because I'm such an animal lover. But, you know, we hit it a good time. It was right around the time when, you know, Paris Hilton and, and her dog Tinkerbell was everywhere. And it was great. And I had it for about 10 and a half years, sold it in 2013. And then I needed to take a break. I needed to take a step back and just, you know, just kind of breathe again. Um, yeah, because that would be no joke. It was a full on Oh, manufacturing yeah. business, right? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I mean, I, I knew I had to leave Los Angeles. So I came down to Orange County where our warehouse was and I had to focus on a hundred percent for it to succeed. And, and that's essentially, that's what I did. So I lived and breathed it. And when you have your own business, you know, there's a part of you that's like, oh yeah, I'll have more time because it's my own thing. But no, I mean, you live and you breathe and you do it on weekends and, but, but still, it it feeds you and it doesn't kind of, it doesn't feel like work when you're enjoying it. Right. But then it stopped being fun. And so I sold it and I wound up kind of going back into my first love of photography and I was doing that. And then I started volunteering and I connected with the Rotary group and I would, I would volunteer and go on these mobile medical clinics where we would go into, you know, Mexico or deep into the Amazon jungle. Like that was, that was a trip. That was me. Wow. That was one of four people to do that. We were one of the last, uh, we were the actually last crew to go into India and administer polio vaccinations via droplets, via the mouth. And I would document that. I would document all the, the experiences and the people and what we were doing. And then I'd write about it. I'd submit it to the local papers and that ignited my love of writing. And I've always been a writer. I mean, my whole life I would journal. I, I just kept everything, but I loved to express myself with the written word. It was a lot easier for me sometimes, you know? And so when my mother passed, that's what I did. And mm. in November of that year in 2019 is when I started to just kind of write down her stories, jot down memories and... You know, and then I took a, a memoir class to, just to kind of get my feet wet and see if this could be a thing. And it was, it, it became a thing. <laughs> you know, at first it was just like, you know, a couple stories. And I would tell myself, I don't, I don't know. Would anybody even want to read this? You know, they don't know my mom. And, and um, I just, I didn't care. I just, I wanted to do it for myself. And then if something happened, fantastic. And I'm so glad I did because I've, people have come to me and said, you know, your, your book has made me reconnect with my, my own mother or father or, or whatever it is, you know, we were mm -hmm. now we're talking or, 
you know, you've inspired me to document. I, I, I've always loved, you know, video work. I have a, some, you know, someone that's doing like a, a little documentary of their family. And then I have a girlfriend that just did a, a little pamphlet about her grandfather and he, her grandfather's still alive. And so he gets to enjoy it and the whole family. And, you know, it's like this. So I kind of feel like anyone can do it. You just ask questions. It was a wonderful way for me to connect with my family who was still, who's still around, who's still very much here. I got to know my father, you know, like the man behind my father, which was really nice. I love that you say high. that the man yeah. behind your father, right? Because it's so interesting how we, we don't, we don't look at our parents as people, right? They're just, yeah. we, we, we just look at them. I was just talking to somebody else about this the other day, how we tend to look at our parents just purely in their, in the, the relationship, who they were to us, how they were to us, what are all of our stories that we have collected about them in relation to us as their child. Right. And right. we don't think of who they were as a person. They were once a kid. They were once a, you know, teen. They made mistakes. They're flawed. And it was beautiful for me to kind of go down that that path of my mother's life, not only with my own memories of her, you know, through the memories of, of others. You know, I spoke with her best friend, Marilyn. That oh was gosh. some of the favorite chapters for me to write with her. It yeah, must have it, been. It, Can I just tell you? So, yeah. so I, 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 for, the, for, the, for the people listening right now. So I, as I'm listening to this story of them and the, you know, their time in the Catskills in the Borscht Belt and, and your mom's best friend calls her because she's got a gig right? Yeah. She's going to sing, right? <laughs> she calls your mom and your mom's first thought is, well, uh, of course, the answer is always yes, you said. And her first thought is, what am I going to wear? <laughs> and, and and I, are you familiar? Have you watched um, The Marvelous Miss Marvelous Maisel? Miss Maisel yes. happened in my head the whole time I was it writing. Must I have been. Just like that. Yeah. I love that movie. Oh I my gosh. Book. I could, and then I'm, I'm, I'm picturing, you know, oh my gosh, I was reading the book and then thinking of your mom's apartment filled with the clothes yeah. everywhere the and apartment was a closet I mean and I loved that bit when like when Marilyn had said yeah when you walked into her bathroom she had coats hung on the on the shower rod it looked like you were walking into a closet when you went to use the toilet you know and she kept her shoes in the oven I mean that, that was how she was even till till the end I mean I would go into their kitchen and I'd be like you know she luckily didn't keep her shoes in the oven anymore but there would be like shoes in the cupboard or you know, she just loved fashion and, and she didn't have enough room to store. No, she was very much a character and very, very much unapologetically herself, which is what inspired the name of, of the book. And I actually have a funny story with that. Originally, it was going to be called Harlow because she was, she had been written up in the, the, the New York Post for her incredible party crashing skills. And they, they, they called her Harlow. So she used, and that's the, the subtitles of, Tales of the Original Party Crasher. She, and you'll get to that part in the book. She was very good friends with Ron Galela. And he was the original paparazzi, basically. Like, you know, he shot everyone from Brando to Jackie O to, in fact, there's a, a documentary out about him. It's called Smash His Camera. And it's, it's what Jacqueline Onassis had said to her bodyguard to do to his camera because he would follow her incessantly. And oh. he actually took that picture, that black and white picture of her walking in New York City with her hair and her face and the, the black and white striped shirt. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I know yeah. that shot. Andy Warhol's favorite photographer. So he was, he, he but when he first started, <laughs> my mother and he were, were friends. And he would invite her to all of these movie premieres in the city. And, you know, I call them the Bonnie and Clyde of, of, of party crashing. But the only <laughs> shooting being done was a, a, a man with his camera. <laughs> but, you know, she would like hide his camera under a table and then go off to look for Sinatra. And she had an obnoxious, as you're seeing, an obnoxious amount of confidence. But, and she, it was just, you know, so there's lots of stories in my, you know, when my mother and father started dating, he would pick her up at these events. She'd introduce him to Ava Gardner, you know. But originally, I thought, yes, okay, I'm going to call it Harlow because the New York Post did this this thing, and I, you know, it's in the book. And and then I I talked to a roommate of mine after I was finished with the book, and you know, I mentioned that I wrote her into the book. There's a funny scene of the two of them, and we were reminiscing about how she was always, you know, 
she was so authentic and so unapologetically herself. And, and then she stopped me and she said, Caroline, that's what you have to call it. You have to call it unapologetic. It's a great that's title. It. It's a great title. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a question for you. How, so when you think of her as unapologetic and I, and I haven't read the whole book, I mean, I, I told you as, and, I'll, and I'll just repeat like that I, you sent me chapter 31, which is you going through your mother's things after, after she passed. And it was so, so touching. And so I, I thought, oh, I, I think I need to read more. <laughs> so I went and got the first sample chapters that were free on Kindle and, and took a look at those. And, that, and I was like, I, I, I think I need a little more. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, so I went ahead and got the book and, and I'm into it now, but I haven't had time yet to, to keep going with it. I will, cause it's, it's good. You got me hooked. You totally got me hooked. What am I asking? I am asking, with that title, unapologetic, with that description of her, do you feel like you have inherited that sense of confidence as well? Or how did that play out for you guys as yeah. mother and daughter? Yeah. 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 I mean, so she was always someone that I observed following her bliss. You know, and she did, she never followed a cookie cutter. This is what you're supposed to do when you're this age or this is what you're supposed to do with email or whatever, you know, I mean, she asked my father out, you know, <laughs> and I, she didn't get married until she was 30, 29, 30 years old. I mean, so in that era, she definitely balked the system. She was her own person. It's interesting, you know, everyone's layered, you know, no one's just black and white. You know, there was a part of her that was, I remember she would say to me, she's like, <laughs> she always had this soft-spoken voice. She's like, wow, you, you can do any, or girls, girls now can do anything. You know, it's like, she said it with like half in awe and half, like, you know, just so proud. And so, and I, and she made me feel like I could do anything. And so I attribute that a thousand percent to her and I try not to cry, but like, she really did. She gave me the confidence to, to just literally pursue whatever I kind of wanted to do. And I was, I was, and am never afraid of failure because it's to me more scary not to try something that's way more scary to me to have like gone through a life and never to have tried something I, I've I'd always been like that and I laugh at some of the things that I've tried but you know I always felt like whatever if it doesn't doesn't work you know at least I felt I feel I know I'm loved it, you know, the, she was, neither of my parents were ever, you know, you need to be this and do this. They were always very supportive. So I'm so grateful for that. For yeah. Long for yeah. Sure. I feel very grateful to my parents for that as well. Yeah. Like that, you know, <laughs> it's not every parent that supports a child who wants to go into the theater. <laughs> you know this very well. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they, and they're all they said was make sure you get your education, right? You know, right. and I majored in theater, so you know, for whatever good that degree does you, <laughs> but you know what it is? I have the BA, I have the piece of paper, yeah. and that then made a big difference when I was out needing to get survival jobs right. as an actor. <laughs> I call it call it my grown up jobs. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, 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 and and. That that whole idea of having that kind of support, that's that's huge. Yeah, that's huge. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it made a big difference for me as well. I as I because my my dream was always to to go into theater and I always wanted to move to New York. And I got a little waylaid. I, I got married early right out of college and and ended up going to Denver for a while, did a lot of theater there, ended up getting divorced because, you know, just realized that we we probably should have stayed friends. Okay. And I was in my mid twenties by then. And I thought, wow, you know, if I don't go now, I don't want to be 80 and looking back on my life and but thinking it. I never tried. Right. You know? Right. And the, uh, I'm with you. I'd much yeah. rather try and fall flat on my face than, than not. Yeah. And then it makes you who you are. I mean, with every opportunity, with every experience in life, you grow, you evolve into the person you're meant to be, whatever that means. Because, you know, I mean, I feel like, you know, it's very rare for one person to have the same trajectory in their life. And, you know, 
Like I look at mine and it's all, I mean, I love that. I, to me, that's the spice of life, the experiencing different things and meeting new people and discovering new things about yourself. I yeah. love that. <laughs> Do you find as you've gotten older that you're more cautious at all? Has that happened to you? I mean, for me in my 40s, in my 40s, I, I feel like I became much more cautious. And now I'm kind of flipping that on its yeah. head and trying to shake it all up again, you know? Have you, as you've gotten older, do you feel like oh. you've gotten more cautious? Like here's a, here's a, for, for instance, no. I, I thought I, that was no, going to be your no, answer. I, I, not at all. Not at all. You know, no. <laughs> I love uh, that. I, I love my, that. You know, my mom was like that too. Again, you know, age is really just a number and I feel like I have a youthful spirit. My mother always had a very youthful spirit, unless I'm going for a long run, then I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. But you know, I, it truly is like, I feel like if you're doing what you enjoy and you're learning, you're, you're in that state of childlike, you know, like mm. why fight open? Like, I don't know. I, 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 it does something to you. Yes. I'm with you a hundred percent. I, I 100% think that the key to the fountain of youth is to put yourself in the position of being a beginner. It's that feeling of like, oh, what could happen? And stepping into something like we did that when we were young. That's what being young was. You, it's like, oh, what might I be? And you had all these visions and po uh, this idea of possibility that yes. went with that went hand in hand with youth. And right. then I, I feel like we kind of backstep it after some time and yeah. and want stability and safety and security whether it's society like i i try not to like buy into what society says well this is how you're supposed to feel or this is what you're supposed to do and it's so easy to but i think that that plays a, a part in how people feel too don't yeah. you yeah yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a whole story around aging that that says that you should slow down as you get older, that you, you know, that you should act your age, right? Oh my goodness. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So when you started down this path, so, you, so you're, you're putting together your mom's things, you're, you're going through her jewelry, which there was a ton of, right? <laughs> Giving yeah. it out to friends. At mm -hmm. what point did you think there's a story here about my mom that I want to I just got the chills because I remember when it was. It it was. I'll I'll backtrack a little. I when when she was in hospice and on her last you know last days and and when I was talking with her, I I promised her that I would take her back to New York City. And she had a love affair with that city like no other. She loved New York. Like I almost feel like New York is like another character in the book. But I I said that I would do that, and that's what I did essentially with her ashes. <laughs> And so it was the first chapter I actually wrote. I didn't write linearly. I, I, I just wrote whatever came to me. I mean, it was such an experience for me to do that. It was more like the act of bringing her, her back. It, it was more that versus like for her to stay in that place for all of eternity. It wasn't that. It was, it was like to go back with someone that you love and to see a place through their eyes. You know, it's like a two-way love offering. <laughs> it sounds really cheesy, but it's like, a gift for them, a gift for, for, it was a gift for me to do that with her, mm -hmm. you know, like this journey together. And it was like, she kind of came full circle because she, she started in New York, you know, as you know, that she met my father, you will see, and then, you know, we slowly, I say migrated West or she, she they migrated West and I was born in Hawaii and my, and then she made her way back to the mainland. When I had my company, I brought my family back in. My dad worked with us and my, my oh, brother wow. worked with us. And so I kind of got him back into in the mainland. And then when my father retired, they moved out to the desert. And, and as you'll see, she, she hated being cold. So there were a lot of funny little excerpts in there. I called them temperature wars. She would have temperature wars with each other. And yeah, I mean, like, you know, you, she'd like to keep it at like a, a, a comfy, like comfy air quote, 86 degrees in her house. And, and my father would, I mean, it's just that my father would never want to open a window because they had a break in one time and he thought the cat would run away. So like all the, the windows were like sealed shut. And, like the, and when you, when you walk into their house in, in, in Palm Springs, I literally, it felt like, you know, saran wrap was like wrapped oh. around your head and like you just <laughs> ended up the a desert and you couldn't breathe. So yeah, but you know, and she even, she liked to, 
she liked to take control of the thermostat even when she came to visit me when I lived in Los Angeles. And so that was like that funny scene that I had with my roommate because she was just like, what's going, you know, so she, you know, my mother would turn it up and then I, she closed it, you know, I'm like, my, my, this would be at night, you know, we'd be in my room and she'd, she'd come to visit me for a month. It's another story, but <laughs> So she, we'd both be, you know, hot, cuddled in bed and then I'd hear the, the door open of my roommate's room. She'd like be stomping down the hall, like turning it back down, you know, and then they just, it would be like this, this, this rotation of temperatures. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you went to New York to scatter her ashes and, and is that when you thought, oh, I'm here and it's like I'm re-experiencing my mom through being in the same space that she loved so much. And mm -hmm. that became the the impetus, the, yeah, the little that, seed that, of it. That's what, that became the impetus, you know, and then I started talking to my father. My father had taken care of my mother in the last few months and she was not an easy patient, let's say. And, you know, he, he, he just, he really, really put it all out there for her and just really did a amazing job taking care of her. But I mentioned this because a couple months after, not even that long after she had passed, he wound up going into the hospital because he had, I think, six or seven ulcers. And I don't even write about this in the book, but he he had so many ulcers from, I don't know, stress or the not stress eating, of no, the situation. not eating himself. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I'm like, gosh, I find myself back at the hospital now with my father. And I'm like, I, you know, please don't let me lose him too. But, you know, my father was always very private and you know my mother was the demonstrative one and you know, they're very yin and yang and so it was like I was kind of getting to know him you know and he would tell me about his life and and then about you know when he first met my mother and when they first fell in love like I was so impressed with his memory. I mean, he he remembered, yes, she was wearing a pink knit dress when she came in and, you know, or this song was playing when I realized I was falling in love with the, her. And I, I just thought it was so beautiful that he remembered these details. And so, of course, I wanted to, you know, write them down. And I'm very much like a recorder, as you, you know, even when I was in you know, photography and writing. Like Document I yeah, yeah, documenting. Yeah, documenting. Yeah. So uh -huh. at first it was kind of just for me. And then I, and I didn't even really know how many stories I would have to write about, but it's interesting once you get going or once I got going, you know, I was like, oh, that, oh yeah, there's this time. And then there's this time. And then there's, you know, and it just grew into like an almost 400 page book. So <laughs> yeah. And then there was editing to do. Oh, that was, but yeah, that took a few months. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. 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 So you ended up talking to a lot of did you talk to her a lot of her friends were they still alive for you to be I, able to access them and their memories of I, what happened I was able I talked with Marilyn so her best friend growing up and that was wonderful I you know spoke with my my um yeah family. what a gift huh what what a what, gift what a I gift mean, it was like she you know it through this experience I got closer with them and on not only that I got closer with my mother Mm -hmm. You know, and talk about like we were talking about in the very beginning about seeing our parents as just parents and not fully fledged people. Doing this truly made me see it was like I had a deeper understanding for why she was the way she was. I mean, it just made sense when, you know, her her father died at a really young age. You know, they used to live in this beautiful, se the coastal section of the Bronx, you know, and then they had to move into more at like, you know, we're tenement buildings. And so she kind of escaped into this place of movies and um, entertainment of the era. And that was like her happy place. And she did that her whole life. And that's what just made her so um, unique because she was always living. She was a fantasist and she always lived in her own world. And it was like this little glamour world that she just kind of concocted for herself, which was pretty funny when you get to the Hawaii part, because, you know, she stood out like a sore thumb. <laughs> really? But, yeah. Was that a harder time for her or? She, you know, she always talked about how she, she, 
she couldn't quite, you know, she made it known that she couldn't quite get her footing there. Uh, she was always very wistful for New York. But honestly, when she left, when she moved away, she went to visit more than anyone. I mean, she she was always, I came to realize she was wistful for what was. It was part of her charm. And she, you know, she realized like, honestly, come on, Hawaii is just... I mean, she called it God's country. And she came back, she went back to visit often after she left. But yeah, while we were there, you know, I remember growing up as a kid amongst all the really tall buildings. So we would spend a lot of time in downtown Honolulu, a um, few blocks of that. But, you know, there she's, she's going to see men in, you know, suits and, you know, because they're there for work. And then we would just kind of hang out in the coffee shops and, you know, my, my brother and I would have our coloring books or our books and we would keep ourselves busy. And she loved Hollywood biographies. That was her thing. She was always reading. She was a voracious reader. And honestly, she probably could have become a Hollywood historian for all that she knew about everyone. And she knew a lot of them too. So she just loved these stories and she would always be reading and we would be doing, you know, our own thing. And, and then we would spend time in Waikiki and that was, there was, you know, always something exciting going on in Waikiki. And I, I remember she would take us to, I think it was at the, the Royal Hawaiian. There was like, we call, they called them tea dances. And so it was all like the big band music, like Duke Ellington. And, you know, I, I think it was my first time I discovered jazz. And so my brother and I, I guess she befriended the band leader. My brother and I would get on stage before it started with this on air sign. And then we'd hop down and giggle and dance with my mom to the music. And I mean, that was like our childhood. Like we were always with her. We were always, you know, I mean, obviously I had my friends too, but like we, I remember spending a lot of time with her and a lot of time, like even with her friends. And I think that's why like I, even to this day, like I love older people. I am very comfortable. Like I love conversation. I love, you know, that to me is, you know, I, I, I probably spent more time with her and her girlfriends or just listening to them talking or I don't know, you know, it, 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 that was my norm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. 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 Sounds like quite a lady. Oh my goodness. <laughs> she was. So cool. I can I can tell that this was, or at least it, it looks to me like this was a very um, healing process for you. Yeah, very therapeutic, very healing. And it made me feel like she was still with me the whole time. Mm. You know, I mean, it's still... it still feels like she's with me. And it's funny, I um, when I, my book was finished, I... I called my father uh, and I had said, you know, okay, the, the book is done. And he's like, well, that's, that's really, it's wonderful, sweetheart. And, you know, and I, but I shared, I was, I was, I was scared. And he said, what do you mean? Why are you scared? And I said, well, first, you know, I'm scared. I'm, I'm scared of what you're going to think. And, and cause he's very private and he literally gave me the permission to release it really. I mean, it's not so many words that like he wouldn't have stopped me, but like, I wanted to make sure that he was okay with everything. And he said, you know, Caroline, these are your memories of your mother. And I guess I'm private, but I'll just have to take that into consideration when reading it. So it was really nice because in order to tell my mother's story fully, I needed to tell a little bit my father, you know, and a right. little bit of my brother. And, you know, they're yeah, in there. And that's tricky. That's yeah, really was, tricky. Yeah. And I wanted to say it. I wanted to tell the story as authentically as I could, but with love. And and I think I did. So that's my yeah. intention. But yeah, I was going to say I, I was worried that I was going to feel like I would have lost her all over again when I was finished writing the book. And mm. that so that was like a fear of mine. And I will tell you that I'm talking about her more now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it, it's, yeah, not the case at all. <laughs> wow. It's interesting because I, I had interviewed some time back. I, I interviewed a friend named Charlene Lamb. And she, when her mom passed, she was an only child. And so she was tasked with clearing out her mom's house. And her mom had just gotten her dream house. And it was, there was a lot of stuff, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And she had to, you know, go through it all by herself and figure out what to keep and what to get rid of. And she, she's one of the things that she does is she curates art shows. Mm -hmm. And so she thought to herself, well, if I, if I were curating a show and I could only keep a hundred things that really spoke to who my mom was, 
what would those be? And that has since launched her onto a whole new career path. And she's looking at doing grief coaching. Mm-hmm. And and she's since curated several art projects from other artists to say, you know, can you do a drawing of her mom had a purse collection. So there's these watercolors of her mom's purses and mm-hmm or at least one of her mom's purses and, and, and the, a few different things, you know, and she, and she's teaching other people how to do that. And, it, yeah. you know, it's a very similar process to, to what you've done mm-hmm. is honoring this person through the things that you identify as being part of who they were. Yeah. 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 And it's interesting too. Not, not everybody um, feels the need to, hold on to things. My father is not that way. He, he's kept very few things, just a few things. And that's, that's all he needs, you know? And Mm -hmm. for me, I'm almost the other, you know, I'm like, I got a license plate, their license plate that said blonde. I know I've got all the, you know, but I'm so grateful that I did that because those things spurred, um, you know, I'll come across Mm. something that, you know, Photographs are are huge, and I, you know, on my socials, I'll, I try and put a like a photograph or a video or something. You know, I try and do something daily of my mother, the two of us together, and she had a lot of of images. You know, and I, at first I was like, oh gosh, am I gonna I'm gonna renounce you? <laughs> and then I just I I forgot that I had put a bunch away in this hope chest. It was like it was like another unearthing of this gift that she gave me, and you know, and then I I was like, oh yeah, it's right her her yearbooks in here and her, you know, and so it was so nice to get those deep because it, it, for me, it, it gave me to have those details to write into the book also, mm. you know? Yeah. They, because, because things can trigger those yeah. memories. Like it's yeah. amazing. The power of objects, right? Right. Yeah. Wow. What have you learned about yourself through this process? You know, I say by learning about her, I've learned so much about myself. Well, I will say that I'm, there, there are, there are parts about me that I, I'm like, oh, that my mother would have said that, you know. Like, so I learned that, you know, you always think you're completely different, but you know, <laughs> there's some similarities, I guess. You know, I, 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 because I, I learned just how much I, I mean, I knew I loved her, but just how much I like loved her and the things that that drove me crazy are the things that I'm celebrating, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, I'm, it's, it's funny, funny how, how that, happens, that happens, right? Yeah. I think that is a very common phenomena. Yeah. You yeah. know, I, I mean, she would always talk about like, you know, let's see, I know when, you know, you used to, you saw this person, you would hang out with, all right, my, heard of you, you know, and now I'm just like, and this, ha-, you know, and it's just, it's, it's interesting how that happens, but you know, um, in learning a lot about my father too, and how, so <clears throat> I will, I'll back up. He was married and you'll get to this. He, he was actually married and I don't want to tell you too much because I want it to be a surprise. Okay. Right. So right. Too much. It's a fine but, line, uh, right? <laughs> I, oh, he was married before. Okay. But that the way they were still very much respectful of each other. And there was still that love there enabled my father and, you know, m- m- myself and in his children, you know, to all still have a relationship. So I'm so grateful for that because, you know, I mean, he's now in Washington. It's like, he kind of came full circle, you know, he had well seven children and now, and two passed away at birth, but so five, five children, I had uh, five half brothers and sisters and then myself and my brother. So he's got seven children. So a lot, it, there's a few that live in Washington and then, you know, there's a grandchild and, and it's, so there's a lot of family. And so now he's surrounded by a lot of family. And I'm so grateful for that because he's, you know, in his nineties and in Palm Springs, it would have just been him and my brother. And, you know, and he wasn't doing that great, not having my mom there, but he, he, yeah, he, he's, he's doing okay now. <laughs> so I'm grateful that's, for that. That's great. Yeah. That's great. It sounds to me like you learned how important your family is to you. Yeah. I learned just how important. Yeah. I mean, and how also I used to think that my family was a very small, you know, unit, just my mom and dad, my brother and I, you know, growing up in Hawaii, it was just the four of us. So 
our holidays during Thanksgiving or Christmas, you know, it was just the four of us. And, but I realized, wait, no, I have this extended family, these, you know, these, these half brothers and sisters, and we're getting to know each other more. And so that's, that's really nice. Wow. Um, really liking it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's really cool. What do you wish you had known when you started down this, this project path? What do I wish I, about writing or yeah, anything or, like, what um, do you like, you know how you kind of, you step into something and, and, and there's maybe some points along the way where you're like, yeah. ah, what was I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> Were there, was there anything like that for you or? Yes. That came to me during the editing process. So mm. I did it all myself, <laughs> including the formatting of the book. And, you know, so I'm learning as I go. And the book was actually finished in like in December, but by the time it published, it was March and that was all editing <laughs> and reformatting and, and like, you know, no, I want the column here. And you know, how do I get this to do it work? And then, so to answer your question, when I was done with everything, then I discovered, oh, wait, there's programs out there where you literally just upload it and press a button and then it does it all for you. And picks the font and the size. And, oh, okay. Oh, that's, that's, really? <laughs> I wish I knew that. I, I bet you wish you knew that. Oh my goodness, here. right? <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That would be, I'd be banging my head against the wall on that one, probably. Yeah. But I know it for the next one if I, if I do another one. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you think is next for you? I mean, you know, you're going to have some time where you're going to be promoting your book, right? Yeah. And, and then I imagine that's going to, that's going to wane yeah. at some so, point. Well, so I'm, yeah, I'm very busy promoting it now. And I actually just finished the audio version of the book because I had a lot of requests for that but I'm, I'm in the process of of doing edits on that so that'll be fun and exciting and I you know that's another thing where I just jumped right in head first without any sort of you know knowledge but just learning along the way then I discovered that recording in an in a in a walk-in closet is really good acoustics <laughs> yes so that's what I, I recorded it in my you know amongst the coats and <laughs> and everything and it sounds pretty good so yeah so I'm I'm kind of working on wrapping that up, but I want to have music in there. And, you know, honestly, it's, it's, it's just an artistic thing. You know, it's like, I would do this regardless, you know, it's just, just another form of telling her story. And so I'm, I'm doing that. And then I actually have gotten some interest in uh, this, turning this into a film. <laughs> So I'm, um, I was going to say, especially when I had that, that whole vision of, you know, yeah. Mrs. Maisel, uh, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I could kind of just what little I've read so far, I can see yeah. very easily becoming something that would be, yeah. that would work well on film. <laughs> so that's exciting. And that's so exciting. Bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. 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 Just diving into it all, all full on. I love how you've taken charge of doing this and 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 making it happen yeah kudos <laughs> thank you because that that requires a lot that requires a lot of energy yes it does it yeah. requires a lot of imagine <laughs> yes faith and and you know when you get in the middle of something it can get you know, a little, you can get a little lost in the woods and you push through that to get the book out. <laughs> so cool. So cool. Good for you. Good for you, man. Oh man. So where do people find the book? How can people get a hold of this? Cause I highly recommend it. First of all, oh, thank just you. from what I've read so far, I'm like, okay, I'm ready for more. <laughs> Bring it. Uh, so they can find it on Amazon. So it's available in Kindle and paperback on Amazon. Uh, there's also a large print version, which I, I thought I'd do because, you know, I don't know, for people who need a little bit help with their eyeballs or that, you know, the different age group. But mm -hmm. so I have those versions now. And then you can find me. I have my website. It's Caroline Nadine Helsing.com. And that kind of links all my socials together, but it's quite easy to find me on social. It's the same handle, Caroline Nadine Helsing author, except Twitter is Miss Helsing 007. 
Oh, 007, I like, I like. Fantastic. And I will have all that information in the show notes for people to come and find you as well. And thank you so much for, for telling me your story. Welcome. Thank you. Well, there you have it. I have to tell you that since I interviewed Carolyn some time back, I did finish her book and it was very touching and, uh, and kept me kept me reading. Her mom was definitely a fascinating woman. So it's, it's a highly recommended read. Go get it. Um, if you want to, to check that out, I'll have links in the show notes for you guys. Wouldn't it be an interesting exercise to try to write the story of your mom or your dad to get a better understanding of who they are or were and why and I wonder how that might affect your relationship with your mom or your dad you know to to do that just really interesting what I really love is Carolyn's very clear love and admiration for her mother um yeah really touching so There you have it, guys. I'm so glad and thankful for you to be on this journey with me listening. Really appreciate it. If you ever want to get in touch with questions or anything at all, please feel free to do that. Send me an email to latebloomerliving at gmail.com. And I do hope you have a very good week. Stay safe and well. Talk soon.